I'm Karen Tim. I'm with the Carroll County Chamber of Commerce Legislative Committee. I'd like to welcome you all this morning. I want to start off by thanking um, Manning Regional for being our gracious host this morning. Thank you. Um, and also welcome to our legislators, Brian Best and Mark Sigabart. Thank you for taking your time to be here with us. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with how we do our uh, forums, we start out by getting some opening remarks from our legislators about what's been going on. Then we have some preset questions that we've given them a heads up about ahead of time. And then we open it up to questions from everybody here. So if you have questions, we're going to kindly ask that you hold them to the end and keep them as questions to what is going on with the Legislative Committee. So gentlemen, if you would like to start with some opening remarks for us about what you've been up to the past couple of weeks. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, I'm glad the snow is gone. <laughs> so, it's Iowa, so wait till tomorrow. We may have more tomorrow. So. Uh, this last week uh, was the first week after the second funnel week. So what does that mean? The second funnel week, Funnel weeks are designed to prioritize bills. The ones, the first funnel week means that a, a bill has to go through a subcommittee and out of a full committee in, in a chamber to survive through the first funnel week, which means it can go now, if it's done that, it, it can go to the House. And the second funnel week means all bills that, that are going to survive have to have gone through another subcommittee and another committee. To, to stay eligible in this session. So the second funnel week, what that really did was prioritize a whole bunch of bills that, uh, that are going to get acted on this year, and, and the ones that didn't survive were, will still be there for next year, but uh, that there's no possible way, unless they're a funding bill or they have money tied to them, uh, that they'll actually get voted up, up or down this year and go to the governor. So this week, uh, by rule, we could only take up bills that had survived the second funnel and or had been on our agenda uh, previous to, to last week. So most of what we did uh, was, was passing bills sent to us from the House, and I think they probably did the same thing. They were passing bills that were sent to them from the Senate. And that means there were quite a few bills this week that actually went to the governor for his signature. Uh, and I'll probably, I'll just list a few of those. Excuse me. Uh, the first one was the governor actually signed on Friday the, the school start date of the 23rd. Uh, uh, I think most of you are probably aware of that, that whole issue. Uh, but he signed that, I think, on, on Friday. Uh, another bill that went to the governor was it dealt with disposal, uh, disposing old cars. It's, there's been a problem out there if you had an old car and you didn't have the title anymore, you, you couldn't take it to a salvage yard because they, they needed to have the title to, to get it taken off the list of the DOT. Well, this bill allows you to take a car that's over 12 years old to a, a certified licensed recycler, and he can accept that car and pay for it and get the title taken care of if you don't have it in your possession. So that's a great, great bill for a lot of people. And uh, any more... Uh, you have what are called car fundraisers out there. You donate your old car and, and to charity, and, and uh, that always was a real glitch in the system because now you had to have the title, and nobody knew where the title was at. Does everybody know where their titles are at right now for your car? <laughs> well, yeah, you're, you're, in a, you're in the minority, let me put it that way. So this was, I think, a great bill, and, and the governor, it's down to the governor now. So. Uh, and I can't predict whether he'll sign it, but I see no reason why he wouldn't sign that bill. Uh, we have for, uh, passed a public health information network bill. This is uh, the health information that goes to the Iowa uh, Department of Public Health. It's, it's, it's a database, and we will be joining with 23 other states that already has this system in, in so, so they can do a lot of research. The, the, you know, the point here is, yeah, you, you know now why, what people are dying from, and, and, uh, and uh, it goes into this registry, and, and uh, uh, so that got passed to the governor. There was a bill this week that dealt with drainage districts. Now, drainage districts is kind of in the news this year because of the lawsuit with water quality. Uh, this really doesn't deal with that issue other than it makes it, it's just a technical bill that makes it easier for drainage districts to merge with one another. and. Uh, I, 
can see this ending up. The whole state's going to end up being a drainage district probably before we're done. That's just my my thoughts. No, I don't know if that's going to happen for sure. But water quality is a big issue this year. So uh, that went to the governor this week. There was a bill that deals with community college instructors, and it, it, it allowed, uh, you know, there was to be an instructor in a community college, you had to have a college degree, and and uh, and some of the hours that you have in life experience could be credited towards your degree. Well, this dealt with that, so it makes it easier for for instructors that are, have have actual experience in their in job qualifications to be instructors at community colleges. So that went to the governor. Uh, they began what is called an Iowa Reading Corps, which deals with volunteers at schools to help uh, kids read. Uh, that's been out there for years. I know there are a lot of schools that have had volunteers that come in and help uh, el lower elementary kids read. And uh, So that bill went to the governor, and uh, there was a bill on subacute placement. Subacute placement is uh, is mental health, actually. Uh, subacute care is, is, uh, is the care you'd get for mental illness that, that's not an emergency. And, and uh, so that bill went to the governor. And we've had a lot of bills this year on mental health because it's such a big issue this year. Since our, uh, most of our revenue growth this year is being uh, is eaten up by the, uh, the Medicaid match that we're required to make. Uh, our, because Iowa's had a fairly good economy over the years, that percentage which started out uh, at about a 60-40, uh, the state share was 40% of the Medicaid bill and 60% federal. Has now moved to about uh, it's in the 55 to 45 range. So we're we're getting higher all the time, and because of that, because we expanded Medicaid, we also have a, a, a rising uh, commitment there because of, uh, of a doctrine the federal government calls uh, 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 not standing your ground. <laughs> the doctrine is. Uh, maintenance of service is what they call it, and which means that if you if if the state provides a service level uh, at a certain dollar amount next year, we can't just uh, back that up without without losing maintenance of service. We need to maintain what we were doing in the past in order to receive more in the future. So it's kind of a catch twenty two, and it and it's part of the reason we're we're our mental health budget is so out of control. And that this year, this managed care idea that's that's going to happen now uh, here this summer uh, is being promoted because uh, it's trying to get a handle on on the expenses that we have as a state on Medicaid. So that's a huge issue, and it's one that's driving the driving the state's budget. We have no targets yet. Targets are numbers that our departments are given for their. Uh, for setting their budget for the next year. Of course, the governor comes out the first of, uh, at his uh, State of the Union address, State of the Union, State of the State address, with, with his own budget. So we, we know what the governor's targets were, but actual departments and, and, and the committees working out budgets, uh, that has gone, very little of that has gone on, and we only have two weeks left. And, and so that's going to be the biggest part of the next couple weeks is, is Appropriations Committee, which I'm on, trying to determine what the budgets are going to look like because we don't have to follow the governors. Uh, the governors actually was uh, was higher. His budget was spending more than we were taking in. And we've been following the, the lead from the House on that we won't spend more than 99% of what we take in each year. And uh, so there's there's needs to be adjustments made there. But So there's very little budget work that has gone on so far that I know of. And uh, because there's no targets, you don't know what the target is the number you shoot for, uh, for, ex for expenses for the next year. If you think of your own family, if you're going to shoot for uh, your household expense of $20,000, uh, you know that's going to be $20,000 and, and you plan accordingly. Well, here in Health and Human Service, the target's probably going to be somewhere in the $1.7 billion range. And, uh, but we've not seen that number. We don't know if it'll be 1.7 or 1.6 or 1.5, and uh, so it's it's going to be a busy couple weeks here dealing with budgets. Uh, there was another bill on EpiPens that went to the governor this week. Uh, EpiPen 
ends are the, the auto uh, injectors that, that if you have anaphylactic shock, which happens at school a lot with little kids, they'll either get a bee sting and they start to swell up, or some are allergic to peanuts, and they'll, they'll start to swell up, and if they swell up enough, it'll shut off the esophagus and they'll smother. So an EpiPen is a dosage that, that treats the anaphylactic shock, and uh, there's a company out there that actually is going to provide those to schools for free, but the law didn't allow them to have them on hand at school until this was passed. So uh, this allows schools to have storage for EpiPens and that it allows the person, at least one person, to be the administrator of that dosage. And, uh, uh, and it, it limits the liability for that person. So it's a great thing for schools and, and any family that has a, an allergy problem where they know they need EpiPens. So that's a great one to get to the governor. I'm very happy to support that. So that's some of the things that went on in the Senate. <coughs> Uh, a few things we talked about in the House uh, this week. Uh, the firearms bill, uh, which was the omnibus bill that went to uh, from the House to the Senate, uh, sent back to the House basically with only the suppressor part of it left intact. And so that was uh, uh, worked on a little bit in the House and basically sent back to the Senate pretty much in the same form as it was the first time. Uh, another bill that went through uh, as you mentioned, the EpiPen bill, we, we voted on that. I believe it was uh, a unanimous vote in the House. It, it seems to me just to be common sense. And believe it or not, I think it took uh, four or six years to get that through. I mean, they've been trying to do that for a long time. And uh, that only makes sense. Uh, another bill that we passed this week in the House is a bill that allows uh, doctors and patients in a situation where there's, uh, where there possibly may have been litigation or there may be litigation, it gives them the opportunity to speak to each other and uh, the, their, their information that they pass along to each other isn't uh, going to be used in the court of law. So it's, and the lawyers even agreed to this, so basically it gives them the opportunity to try to work out an agreement before everything just goes to lawsuits all the time. And that's something that uh, I believe passed unanimously also. Um, Mark uh, talked a little bit, I think, in the last couple of forums about the Growler Bill, which got through the House this week. And the Growler Bill allows uh, uh, places that would have a license to sell uh, beer, uh, such as convenience stores, IVs, places like that, the ability to refill growlers. And what a growler is, it is it's like a 64-ounce bottle that uh, the customer actually owns. He takes his bottle in and they can fill it from a tap. And this is going on in many states. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's a reckless bill in any way because what you've got is if you've got a convenience store, first of all, if the convenience store wants to do it, the, uh, the beginning upfront cost is around $15,000 and you actually have to have training on how to do it. And once you have poured that growler with the beer, and, and the beer is not going to be like your domestic, it's going to be a craft beer that uh, maybe is uh, manufactured, hopefully most of them are in Iowa, and most, a lot of these companies are young entrepreneurs who don't have the, the ability to bottle and can beer, so it gives them more of a market. And uh, what they call the beer snobs are the ones that are really gonna be the ones that do this. And they're not the ones that go out and are just trying to get a beer so they can get hammered. They're the ones that like to taste special types of beer. And so they would have the ability to get these beers, take them home. Uh, the beers would be available. And I think I even saw Heidi already had a bunch of growlers I was just there yesterday eating lunch, and they've already got the growlers all set up and ready to go. So uh, I think it, it, it's good for Iowa business that maybe wouldn't have the ability to get that to the marketplace. And the way that the, the bottles are hermetically sealed, uh, you can't just go down the road and pop it open. Well, I suppose you could, but then you're going to get a ticket for open container, just like you would if you went into Casey's and bought a 22 ounce and popped it open. So I, I think that the uh, I, I think it's a good bill. It, it did pass, I think, uh, 94 to 6 in the House. And so uh, those were a couple of things that uh, we passed this week. Uh, it's been a very interesting week. Uh, I, I got a, a Facebook from a friend who said, uh, and it was kind of comical, he said, on Thursday, we had a Wiccan priest, and we ha also had a, uh, right after that, 20 seconds after she was done, we had the folks that were uh, reenactors 
dressed in what would be the uh, uh, Civil War garb to honor the 150, 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, I believe is what that was. So that was just kind of an interesting day. All kinds of weird stuff goes on in the Iowa House. And uh, sometimes it's just amazing what you can, what you can do in 15 seconds later being doing something totally different. So uh, it's, it's been an interesting week. And uh, again, uh, as, a, as a freshman down there, I gotta tell you, this is, uh, in my mind, is the most uh, gratifying thing I've ever done. And I'm very humbled uh, to be represented down at the State House. So with that, uh, We did too, yeah. You very nicely took care of number two yeah. for us. Yeah. Uh, could you gentlemen please explain the authority of the governor and the closing of the two mental health facilities in Clorinda and Mount Pleasant, and what do you propose for the alternative long-term plans for these patients that are currently in these facilities? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because it, it made me move to, to what, where does the governor get his authority here? And, uh, in the Iowa Constitution, it really doesn't say he has administrative powers, but when, in, in, in fact, he really does because he controls the veto pen and and he appoints most of the, one of the other things we did last week was appoint people, the Senate appoints uh, uh, people to a bunch of these boards and commissions that the governor recommends, and, and we did several of those, and I was going to go through those, but I'll do that when we get a minute. But they included the, the Board of Regents, and Rod Roberts to the Department of Inspections and Appeals and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, But it also included, and we didn't actually vote on Chuck Palmer, who's the Health and Human Service Director. Uh, for some reason, uh, we jumped over his appointment, so uh, he's still uh, eligible to be appointed. He just wasn't, didn't, it's a recorded vote, actually, and uh, uh, we didn't vote one way or the other, up or down on Chuck Palmer. He just didn't not unusual, it just happened that that's the case. But, uh, so the governor has, has those powers to, to veto, uh, and, and, when he, and he also recommends the budget for the next year, as I said, in his state of the state address, is, he, is usually when he turns in his, his budget for the next year, which this year zeroed out the funds that would go to Mount Pleasant and Clorinda, which uh, house uh, uh, acute mental mental illness patients and, and, sub and, and uh, dual diagnosis patients and that sort of thing. And so that's where his power comes from, the fact that he controls, controls the budget via the veto and the recommendation for the, the, uh, the, the next year's, in the next year's budget. So, uh, but can, does that just happen carte blanche? Well, no, because in the end, uh, the final decision maker on whether you open or close a, a place goes through the Centers for Medicaid, uh, the, the CMS it's called, the Center for Medicaid Services. And uh, they're the authority who either license or uh, unlicense a facility. And, and uh, so it all has to go through their okay in the end. And, and uh, that's a long process and, and uh, we'll see how that works. So, uh, but currently the governor hands-on guy and the CMS is the final approval so uh, we'd have to hear back from the Center for Medicaid Services it's also Medicare and Medicaid service but this short term is CMS so uh, that's another authority level so and what's the other part of the question what do you propose for alternative long-term plans for patients in these facilities well uh, we've mostly passed bills this year out of the Senate that are trying to slow down the process on closing those two facilities because we're not sure if we're ready with our regional system to to know what to do with those patients yet and uh, we keep getting good comments from the regions at least the ones I've contacted that they they are finding locations for for patients that that they're, they're, they're trying to place and I attended a, a Iowa Healthcare Association conference last week and they actually had a, a speaker there that would be one of the, the bidders for this mental, uh, this uh, RFP that's being proposed for the managed care system. And he's actually worked for Wellmark. It's a subsidiary of Wellmark that's doing this. And uh, 
he had a very favorable reaction from the, most of the, and most of the people at this conference would have been probably nursing home administrators and nurses, nurse administrators and nursing homes. And, and the question is, how is the funding going to flow? And, and unfortunately, I think most of you, the people that I've talked to, their experience when, when it was done by, H, by Health and Human Service, it was a very slow process. You know, you'd have an application for a patient that might be this thick, and it would take a month before you'd find out that they were even eligible and they would accept them into the roles. And by that time, you've already had them in your facility for a month, and now how do you get paid back? You have to go through that same system to get reimbursed. Well, the, the, uh, the guy from Wellmark that was speaking to the group uh, went through that with them uh, and, and was well aware of the problem. And, and uh, you know, it's really a well-managed and thought-out plan, I think. A lot of the questions that I've heard over the last uh, two months was, what is the plan? You know, how's this going to work? Well, that's what these guys are going to provide. This is the plan that they're, they're coming forward now in this request for proposal that's going to be due here in the middle of June. Uh, and so the plan is, is they're, they're coming up with a plan. And I think most of the people that were at this conference were pretty satisfied with the response they got from the Wellmark guy, at least. But they, they won't be the only bidder. There's probably four or five other huge uh, uh, health provider groups out there that will probably bid on this plan. But they're the ones that are going to provide the plan. So uh, I was pretty encouraged by the, what I heard that day. So I think that's where, and going to that managed care system is, is going to save us money in the long run. And right now, the, you know, the governor's budget was going to cut $51 million out of mental health costs. And uh, $51 million, I don't know how anybody, you know, when you think about it, how do you, how do you save $51 million out of the system? It's, it doesn't seem possible, but uh, we'll see. I, I, I think it's something we got to do because we got to get a handle on this cost so that it quits eating up all the. I mean, this year it was going to literally take up all the great revenue growth the state had in one in one department. So it's 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 a huge issue for Iowa and, and for the you know the, the mental health care system. Uh, I think anything I would add to that would probably just be redundant. Um, other than that, uh, the whole the whole model for uh, all types of patients that are in any type of institutionalized settings, be it uh, mental health, uh, be it uh, uh, intellectual disabilities, places like New Hope Village, things like that, the, the model is becoming more and more home and community based. And that's just, uh, Nationally, that's what's, that's what's taking over and driving everything that we do. And uh, so other than that, there's not a, not a whole lot I have to say. I mean, that ship has only left the, the yard, and that's the way it's probably going to have to be. We have to try to make as much, uh, give those those folks as much mobility to get out into the community as possible. Uh, we even had a company come in and talk to us in uh, one of our, I don't know if you were in that meeting or not, Mark, and we are in Health and Human Services, but there's a company out of, Pennsylvania that claims that they can take anybody, anybody that's in a state institution, a mental health institution, and put them in a private home, in, in even your worst, uh, well, I wouldn't say worst, but the most complex uh, uh, diagnoses of, of mental illness and put them in, in a home and do it at a, at a very inexpensive way. And I guess I would have to see that to believe it. Um, but it's, it's, that causes me a little bit of concern. But that's what we were told. And so uh, that, that's really all I have to add to the bottom. Thank you. Um, our final question is, what is the standing of school funding, and where do you see it progressing? Can you start on that one? Go ahead. OK. Uh, in the House, uh, the, uh, I believe that the, the Republican caucus is very much in favor of just a 1.25. And uh, there's been a lot of angst about the 1.25, but when you when you look at our budget and you see the amount of money that we have to spend this year over what we had last year, um, it's a fact that education is getting $100 million. And of all the money that's left over, uh, there's not near enough to fund any growth in any other parts of the state government, which means that things like uh, uh, judicial system and uh, public safety, the highway patrol, uh, 
all these groups are going to be going status quo or, or taking less. Uh, one thing that I've, I've said, and uh, I'll, I'll say this again, is I, I do believe that as a state we micromanage a little bit more than we should when it comes to allowing schools to get monies out of categories and, and let them use that. And another thing that I, I do see, and I, I sent this out of my email that I send out, if anybody is on that email and you want to be, uh, let me know, because uh, I send out weekly emails, and those are also published in the paper, so if you see in the paper, it's the same thing that I sent out. But uh, uh, I believe that transportation is a really big issue too, in schools that are rural, that have to drive so far pick up these kids, and there's no other way of getting that money than through the general fund right now. And I think we've got to find a way to ease that burden a little bit because there's a huge disparity between what some schools spend and what a rural school will spend per student on, on getting them to school and back home. And uh, I, I think that's something that we really need to look at and try to provide some flexibility for the schools. Uh, and in the Senate, of course, the Senate is led by a different majority than the House, and they proposed 4% early on. So the conference committee, which is trying to determine what the, the uh, compromise will be, is was working between 4% on one hand and 1.25 on the other. And last week, uh, the, the Democrats in the Senate offered to drop their 4% down to 2.625, which is half the difference that uh, they were separated by. and But the committee voted uh, voted that down, so they haven't come to a compromise there yet. And it, it, it would seem that the, the, the 1.25 is where the House wants to stick, which is half of that conference committee, by the way. They want to stay at 1.25. Well, let, let me explain what 1.25 does. It adds about $100 million to over last year's uh, supplemental state aid. and. If you remember, three years ago we passed what was called the, the, the teacher leadership, leadership uh, bill, which adds fifty million dollars a year. That's uh, and this will be the and it was fifty million dollars a year, and not every school you had to apply for it. So about a third of the schools received that money the first year. <coughs> In the second year, about another fifty million dollars worth. And another third of the schools have picked it up. So we're, I think this is our third year. And so they're still getting that, that 50 million, that other 100, that the, the 50 million from the first year and the 50 million from the second. So in those last two years, it, it's jumped uh, $100 million just in the, the learning, the teacher leadership uh, money. And uh, plus the 1.25 would be another $100 million on top of that. So uh, it's, it's significant. It's not enough. Rural schools need. There's so many things that, uh, if you had to write a flow chart on the board here to show how schools are funded, uh, it'd look like spaghetti, because there's there's silos of money that they can only spend certain things on, and that if they can't spend it, they don't lose it, but they they don't get to spend it anywhere else. Well, so what's happening this year is. Since it's such a struggle, there are a lot of these categories that are being opened up to be spent in other places besides what they were categorically determined to be spent for in the first place. So is that a good thing? Yeah, I think it is because it, it, otherwise the schools were handcuffed by all this, uh, this accounting mechanism that's out there. Why that accounting mechanism was ever set up in the first place, I, I don't know. It was control, it's, it's the opposite of local control. It was state control is why that was set up that way, but uh, it's got schools so tied up in knots that, uh, and most legislators too, by the way, and I, as I was talking to, to, uh, to Brian here after we left the last session, uh, you know, it's too bad we, we need to hear more from schools and proposed legislation on how to fix this problem. I don't know if there's anybody smart enough in the place to fix it. It's very, very, uh, and unless we lie, if we rely on the governor, then we're really in trouble. So, <laughs> I, I, I don't think we need to go there, but we need somebody that's that's well schooled in that and an accountant that can can figure out, you know, what are we what are we doing here that really makes sense and that will help our schools survive out here because they're really struggling. 
I know Charlie, the very first week we uh, met in Carroll, you know, you talked about PEPL funding, which is uh, uh, a situation where a school might have a lot of money in a PEPL account and they can buy a new school bus. It's PPEL, it's physical plant. Uh, I'm not sure what this last term is. Equipment by the Equipment by the Okay. So it's physical plant. And so you can buy a brand new school bus and you might have a lot of money sitting in there. And then uh, all of a sudden you need a transmission for that bus, which would cost you maybe $7,000, which you have to take out a general fund. And general funds are so tight that you really, you really don't want to use that money there. And you've got all this money sitting in that capital account. So I, I think it forces, uh, it forces decisions that aren't really the best decision. And so the, the PEPL thing that you talked about, yeah, Charlie, is uh, in ways and means, and I, I would be shocked if that doesn't go through and they change that, giving that a little bit more flexibility. Uh, a lot of things that we do in education are, in my opinion, and I'm new at this, that I'm looking at it and I've seen the way things have been done for 40 years, and I think, well, why are we, why are we doing it this way? And, the answer sometimes is, well, because it's the way we've always done it. And I think we do need to start thinking out of the box a little bit. It's not rocket science to do some of these things. And uh, we, like school boards and administrators, are smart folks, and, and school boards are there to, to manage that. And I think we need to give them a little bit more flexibility. And our, I'm, I, Lynn Ralston's the school that I went to, I graduated from. And uh, I think all of us here in Manning, Coon Rapids, uh, Audubon, Westside, you know, we all want to keep our schools and uh, I hope I hope to God we can find a way to do it. Well, we'd like to open up to the floor for questions. If you have a question, please stand, be recognized, let people know your name. If you're an independent citizen just asking the question or if you're associated with some organization, please let us know that as well. Hi guys, and thanks again for your work. Uh, Mark Beardmore, Carroll County Board of Supervisors. On Monday's agenda, uh, we have planned to discuss, uh, probably have a very robust discussion about clean water and how to approach this Des Moines Water Works lawsuit. We've been, and I, I'll use this forum to invite everybody that is in attendance. It's a huge item that uh, I said a couple years ago, mental health was one of the biggest issues that ever Carroll County faced. Now been eclipsed, I think, by clean water. We're not part of this lawsuit yet, uh, but we've been approached by the Iowa uh, Drainage District Association uh, to uh, fund. Uh, I think they're, they're, it's not a legal defense fund yet, but it's uh, essentially something to ward off legal defense. And, and they're asking every county to uh, contribute $5,000 per year. Uh, for three years uh, into a fund uh, to help uh, mitigate, I think is the term they're using, uh, th this lawsuit. Um, subsequently, we've been approached by the three counties uh, that are our neighbors and friends that are involved in this lawsuit to say, well, before you go do that, why don't you give us the money so we can start building our legal defense fund? So we're gonna have a very vibrant and, and robust discussion on this come Monday. And um, it's not important yet how I feel or how Neil or the rest of us feel. We're asking you guys, uh, what's your advice? What, what are you hearing from your perspective and what kind of guidance are you giving to the counties in your district? Uh, well, there was a senator from Northwest Iowa that was recommending that we not support the city of Des Moines anymore. Uh, I didn't go that far because it's going to take, guess what, a lot of the people in the city of Des Moines to help fix this problem. This is a problem everybody uh, has got to be involved with. And so, uh, you know, I keep an open mind if possible. It's in the hands of the lawyers now, and there's probably not a whole lot you can do that will change any of that progression. And we know it's going to take a long time before this really gets decided. And uh, it actually occurred to me that, that everybody buys water in a bottle anymore. And uh, there, there's, no, there's no deposit on water bottles at this point. But wouldn't it be a perfect place to have a deposit on a water bottle and use that water, uh, that deposit, to fund a clean water mitigation plan of some sort? 
And I got I got some bad reaction from some of my colleagues and, <laughs> and, and good reactions from others. So I, you know, but it's going to take us all. It's, it, we can't split the state down the middle and expect to get this problem solved. We need to work at this together because it's a huge problem. And, and I drink Des Moines water out in Clive every every day, and, and uh, I don't know that I'm. I'm starting to think, gee, it is tasting funny. <laughs> so, you know, but that's that's sad. But uh, you know, I, I think we got to work together at this and, and uh, keep your minds open because if you you don't want to burn any bridges that you wish you had there yet, a few years late, down, farther down the road. So, I guess that'd be my advice. But thanks for the question, Mark. From my standpoint, it just seems like uh, the legislature themselves are just trying to get their their arms around what's going on. Uh, I, I think we're all just kind of uh, sitting here and thinking, uh, and, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, Secretary Northey is probably really looking into this, is probably uh, going to be a leader, I hope, in, in trying to figure out a way to work with, uh, with the Des Moines Water Works and try to find out, try to, try to find a way that isn't so confrontational. But as, as a legislature, I, I think we're all still just trying to understand what's going on and, and what the ramifications are going to be, because I don't think any of us really know. So it's just so new to us. Virginia, Virginia I can myself to follow up on his. Who should pay for it? The state, the county, the districts. Uh, who who do you think should pay for it? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's really going to be a problem when. If, if he would ever win that lawsuit. And then the question is, Des Moines gonna have to pay folks right down the river because they're putting the nitrates right back into the water. So, I mean, it's, it's to me, it's, it's something that, uh, uh, I, I wish that they would find a way just to reach something before this gets really going robo and, and there's a lot, uh, a lot of money that has to be spent on litigation. Because I, I see things that show me that there are a lot of major efforts being done in the state's uh, funding of the of the nitrate uh, issues and things like that. So I think that reasonable things are being done, and we are trying to uh, lower the nitrates in the water in these in these rural areas. Uh, the state needs to be a player in helping fund, especially in the in the actual mitigation on the ground sort of things. The IDOLs have done a lot of work with that. Few years, and, and if we had extra money this year, I'm sure that the IDOLs would get. In fact, I think they're slated, but I haven't seen a budget on it because I, but we talked about that earlier. Uh, they're asking for eight million dollars for for on farm practices to help mitigate uh, nitrate levels, and, and uh, uh, with a tight budget, who knows how that'll turn out? But uh, you know, the state needs to be a player. In and it's been a player in the past, and it's had great results. I think we need to keep reminding everyone that that uh, we've had some some good results from the practices that have been put in place. But farmers uh, usually share fifty percent of that cost, so so you know it's it's you can take and pretty much double whatever the state puts into it as uh, as uh, actual expense that have been used on the farm itself to to help lower nitrate levels. But nitrate, you know, there's I, I read this in my old agronomy book. There's uh, 33,000 tons of nitrogen in the air above every acre in Iowa, but none of it's available to the plant. Uh, as soon as you get a rainstorm with lightning bolts, you get some of that uh, to come down in the form of nitrate right on the ground, and uh, most of the, it's converted in the soil through microbe action, and there's, there's products out there now that they are just coming on the market. This first I've heard of them, that the helps grow the microbes in the soil, which are are producing or eating up the, the nitrate. So there's there's some natural things that can can happen there. Of course, you don't know enough at this point. Uh, uh, this is kind of like the school was. You keep slapping band aids on it. Pretty soon, you can't tell what in the world where the sore was at. If we keep slapping band aids on the nitrate problem, have we really solved it, or have we called created another problem? That's why we need research that tells us, yeah, this is definitely going to help us and, and not create a worse problem farther down the road. Okay. I'm Charlie Nix, Crew Mappers, and, and I want to just point out on the school financing issue, and I'm sure you guys are aware that if no compromise can be reached, and you did mention the word compromise, when 
customer. Uh, if there's no copyright breach, then the allowable work will be zero. And I think that's the fear of a lot of uh, school administrators. So is there a compromise that you could accept? I mean, Mark and, and, uh, and uh, Brian have both said 1.25, but is there some other compromise greater than that? And you two would be personally agreeable to, uh, so that we wouldn't default to zero percent growth? We don't sit and talk about this, so this is this will be. <laughs> coming from the heart. This is going to be coming from. I don't know where he's at, but if if I could have done four percent on the first day, I'd have, I'd have voted for it. Four percent. But we had that. Well, I did, and I voted against it because it was a, it was a, more than the, the recommendation. I don't know. So you're going to say how? Now, what did he say? The four percent. Mark was put up by the Democrats uh, in the Senate on about the third week in January, I think. That would have been the week after after the governor's state of the state address. And at that point, with no budget targets and no revenue estimating conference. See, the revenue estimating conference is the group that tells you what they think the income is going to be for the next year. And uh, the governor bases it off of the December conference and uh, and and that won't change unless the one that's done it there's a revenue estimating conference in March and most of us feared that that was going to be quite a bit lower than what the December one was because farming income is going to drop about 50 percent this year if you're not aware of that it's uh, it's it's market it's in the farmers are really down this year so uh, but it turned out it didn't drop that in fact, it was uh, it was just a little bit lower than what the March over December, so it dropped a little bit. But I think the long-term forecast for for most of us is farm income is going to be low lower, and uh, and probably our economy is going to be a little bit lower because John Deere and a lot of big manufacturing are laying off people like crazy. And, uh, but having said all that, if it came back in the conference committee and they had four percent, I I'd, I'd vote for that. Well, they proposed 2.625. If you add the 4% the and the, how did they get that? You add the 4% and the 1.25 together, and, and the difference there is 2.65. Yeah. Um, it's it's, to me, it's like being on a typo. You know, I, I, I've said this, I said it already today. I, I do not want to see our, our rural schools and I think as, as much as anything, if we can uh, loosen up the funding mechanism, I think that's, that's a, a good way to start this. This year, right now where we're at, um, 1.25, with 1.25 now, we're already reducing or status quoing everything else we do in the state government. Um, if, if we were to go to 2.6, I believe, uh, and, and I may not have this number exactly right, but I'm guessing it's over $100 million, the 2.62 a year. That would have to shift all those funds into education and we have to find a way to, uh, to find a revenue for those other, those other parts of government. So for me, I, I would like to see, and if it was a, a slight increase and, and that's, what, that's where it's at, I wouldn't be against it, but it would mean that we would really have to sharpen the pencils in other areas. And I'm, I'm just, I, I would like to see more flexibility and, and it remain at 1.25 this year. And then, uh, I'm, I'm so new at this, I got so much to learn, that I know one thing, that I don't want to see our state um, overtaxing or, or trying to figure out a way to fund something that we did one year because we can't come up with the money the next year and we've overfunded it. So um, I, I would be okay with, with a small increase, but at the same time, uh, if, that's, if that's what the two parties agree to. But at this time, I, I think 1.25 is the realistic, the realistic number. The question that I ask though is if Democrats won't accept 1.25, are you comfortable defaulting to zero percent growth, do you think the school districts will be able to? Uh, I would not. I would not want to see that happen. 
No, I want it at least a 1.25 absolutely. Yes. I don't think it's going to be addressed this year. Um, I wish it was. Uh, I know uh, one representative had an idea of uh, doing a, a 1.03 per pupil increase for schools that were a certain amount over the uh, the average. So if you had high transportation costs, you could at least absorb or get some of that back. Uh, I don't think it got any legs. Uh, it didn't make it through all the funnels, I assume. I don't believe it did. No. But those are the kind of things I think we really need to look at doing because it, it, it just makes sense. Is that something, I mean, is it commonly talked about? Were there other bills or was there just that one effort? Well, that, that was the only effort on transportation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I think a couple has a good chance. Uh, there's uh, another uh, idea of taking uh, what they call, I think, dropout money and high risk money, which are actually in two different categories and commingling them. So if you had uh, students at risk, you'd have a little bit more flexibility in how you use that money, which to me just makes common sense. I don't think that's gonna be a silver bullet by any means, but I mean, it's, it's a step, and I think these things do take time. Uh, but I, I feel like uh, in, in, in the party, I feel like uh, I probably <coughs> am one that at least wants to look at this as a new person and say, why have we been doing it this way for 40 years? Why, why can't we make some, some changes and do things that make a little bit more common sense and give a little bit more control to local districts. And then uh, for you, you mentioned having some, um, some more <coughs> educators and administrators involved in that. I know there is a small rural school coalition. Have, are you actively engaged in conversation about uh, that? I was telling Brian this morning as well. I've never yet had a, a lobbyist from the superintendents or the school boards come and talk to me on, on any of these issues. I, I can't, I, I find it almost unbelievable that it, I'm, they seek you out on every other issue out there. And I'm not complaining about the lobbyists, but I don't know why they're, they're so, uh, I, I've never met them. I wouldn't know if I saw them in the, in the doorway. They, so what they're, what they're up to, I don't know. But I, it kind of goes back to that hodgepodge I was talking, talking about. If, if they would come forth with a, with a, bill that would redesign, and, and I hate to say the word study, but it seems like the whole funding mechanism needs to be studied to improve on it all, uh, so that this wasn't so complicated, and and, uh, and it would open up the dollars that, that are out there, because who, who knows how many dollars are really out there? We, we hear about mental health, and they say, well, there's a, we knew the regions had $100 million in, in. We knew that number, didn't we, Mark? But, Go into it. We don't know what's out there for schools or, or why they can't get their hands on it. So if, uh, you know, if that needs, if, but that's kind of a long-term thing. We can't, although it would be a spending bill, so I would say even to pass, if they say anything can actually move past the phones if, if the leadership wants to do it. So I guess uh, keeping the pressure on the leadership, not necessarily, <laughs> we would love to be leadership, but say tongue-in-cheek <laughs> but if you if you keep you know working on the governor and you keep working on um, Bill Dix and, and, and Michael Gronstall and and uh, Greg Paulson, Greg Paulson and, Linda and, and Linda Upmeyer and who's the chairman of the education source Jurgensen? Ron Jurgensen. Ron Jurgensen. I mean if you keep you keep the pressure up on those guys and they get enough uh, you know I know that that works works on me <laughs> so uh, uh, that's that's the best place to go at this point because they're the ones calling the shots in this thing, and uh, the rest of us stand back and, and uh, look over the fence a lot of the time and uh, can't seem to get any traction. So. All right, John uh, Ryan from here. Um, two quick questions. One is a little bit on the mental health. Uh, one of the issues that emergency rooms and our physicians have is literally not being able to find a place for somebody. And I had a person who spent 36 hours in our emergency department who 
needed an inpatient bed. How are we, with all the changes that are being talked about, how are we going to deal with that issue? Because that's an acute issue. And then the second one I'll throw on is where are we with Medicaid debasing this year? Where do you think that's going to go? Uh, the first question uh, on finding a bed, and, and uh, uh, we, the bill, last year we had a bill that was going to set up a, a registration kind of a system that, that uh, could be used to locate beds for, for acute patients and it was defunded the veto power, the governor took that away. That bill's now through again this year. Uh, I don't know that it's ready to go to the governor yet, but I, I'm pretty sure we voted on it last week. Yeah, I think $200,000. Yeah, it was, it's not a, a large amount, and it's even a nonprofit group that will set this up. Uh, but that would help a lot, and I know there was a fear. I talked to a psych nurse up in Carroll here a couple weeks ago that uh, she says, well, that scares us because it's uh, she was under the impression that they had to take these patients that they weren't that they weren't set up to handle. And I said, no, it does. It just it's just a registry. It's like booking a room at a hotel, and uh, here's what you need. And if you have one available, we'll put you in the system so that they can they can book. Uh, sheriffs can go there and find out where to send patients or hospitals. And so that's that's a good answer to that first question. Now, the second question was, uh, where, where do we stand with Medicaid rebasing? Medicaid you know? rebasing. Well, in, in the governor's proposal, he was he was uh, supportive. He was supportive yeah. of rebasing this year. So, as far as I know, it's it's still in there. I, but I and I supported the appropriations to keep it in there. So, that's where I would be. Yeah, I support the rebasing too that he's put into place. Thank you. Yes. You know. I, the thing that I think is a little bit confusing is. When you're rebasing, and then you got managed care organizations coming in in the near future, mm -hmm. what is that rebasing even going to mean to us? And maybe you understand that issue better than I do. That uh, they're going to they're going to kind of set the stage for pricing, I'm assuming, through their RFPs. So you got to wonder what the rebasing is really going to do for us. But I, I would be in favor of, of, of helping out a little bit because I know your your levels are low. I understand. Yeah. I'm Doc Annenberg, retired MD from Peril, speaking for myself as usual. And I was just reading that famous uh, Des Moines Register today. It's kind of an informative article in there on Mitchellville Prison. And uh, there's a, you said things are getting complicated. Well, this sounded complicated. And I don't know, both of you are on social services. Do, do you uh, handle some of the social services in the prisons? No. No? It's in the... Well, not that I know of, anyway. Well, anyway, there was a, a real high percent, 67 or percent, of, were mentally ill plus substance abusers, so, dual diagnosis so you're that. talking about. And it just, in my mind, it, there's only 27 uh, lifers in the, in the, according to this article. Hmm. So most of them come back into Manning and Carroll communities and live among us. And I just wondered if they're getting treatments or are they just warehousing them? Say they can't find a bed and they get into the, the ones that are in prison now. Yeah. Uh, I think that I, I don't can't answer that. I, I, I'm not sure that they get treatment at all uh, while they're in prison. That's been a big issue for them, I know. So. They do. Do they? Yeah, they do. There's mental health facilities within the prisons. I have heard it's far cheaper to have them in the <laughs> handle it in the prison than it is trying to be. Yeah. Different set. Anyway, they're that's overcrowded, that's and they showed these bunk, double bunk beds right out in the, not even in the cells, right out in the, in, yeah. in the public room. And uh, I scratched my head, and I think they spend quite a bit of money for, for prisons, and they got a good population, of course, mm -hmm. a lot of criminals, around the world these days. But I just wondered if, if what was going on in, the, in the, say the. There's only one prison for females in the whole state, and that's Mitchellville. And it sounds like they've spent a lot of money down there, uh, adding on and remodeling and stuff. But according to this article, they, they, they ought to sharpen a pencil or re, you know, retarget the monies or something down there. I don't have a good answer. I, I don't deal with that <laughs> judiciary or judicial. <laughs>
prison system, that's for sure. Yeah. Large number. But they don't stay there. It's only 27 numbers that's currently that stay for a lifetime. Did, so they all come out back out. <laughs> Live among us. Uh, what were the issues in uh, West Side that those people were concerned about? Weren't you at West Side before you came here? Uh, I say uh, school funding was probably 75% uh, of the conversation. So they think like we do over here. How do you, how, how do you think? <laughs> Tell me. No, I mean the same issues as this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wouldn't say anybody. Yes, yes. I mean, school funding is, is definitely, you know, it's it's what drives the whole the whole budget, the whole state budget. And so it's definitely a very important topic. Unfortunately, it's sort of turning into a turf war. You know, we have school funding that's that's threatening to, to eat up all the, the funding that the state would have available for other things. And so now people are starting to point, well, you know, why are you taking money from there? Why don't you give it to us first? So it, it's getting ugly. And that's not good. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but it is really turning into a turf war between uh, funding schools or funding water quality or funding any of the thousands of things we're funding in the United States. so much for coming in again. Thank you.